<sighs> How are you? Pretty good. Um, it's 8 p.m. here, uh, and it's afternoon for you. Yeah, it is. It is. Just had lunch. <laughs> so where do you want to start? Um, where do I want to start is probably the question. Um, the the catalyst, I can't, you know, I think I sent you a document about the catalyst. There's been many catalysts. And um, <clears throat> given where we are, given the, the, the huge issues we face, a lot of the decision making seems to be not just here, but all over the world, it's firefighting. And so it occurred to me that if we, when we make a decision, if we looked at the causes of the, of the, of the, of the issue that we're trying to treat, well, the first one is actually ask that question, what, is, what are we trying to, what are we trying to solve? Um, because quite often that, that doesn't get asked. So if we stated the issue rather than just come up with a solution out of a vacuum, we might understand better why we why our solution is um, tackling that issue and if we then if we if we stated that issue it then might be possible to say well actually is there any other way of dealing with this issue um, and we've got one in in the UK at the moment where we've got a, a housing crisis so this is a, a, probably a good example and so the solution is to build more houses uh, which sounds obvious until you start looking at the real reasons why we've got a housing crisis. And actually, it's because houses are more expensive. So people aren't, be, aren't able to afford the houses. So then the question comes, well, why are they more expensive? And, and so on and so forth. So it occurred to me that if we actually recorded and, and publicly recorded the issues we're actually trying to address... Um, because what happens when it comes down to to my locality, we the, exper the experience we have we just, we just get a new a new housing development, and the only thing we can do we can really do is object. We've got no choice to do anything else or accept. And so there seems to be a disjuncture there. So uh, and 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 this there's a parallel with this when um, there was a competition, I don't know whether you knew about the, uh, the global challenge, challenge, yeah, mm -hmm. to, to um, come up with, a, with a, a, an alternative to the UN. Well, lots of questions come up there. Well, you're not going to create an alternative out of, again, out of nothing. So, and I was re referring back to the Sunflower Movement, the sensible thing to me is, seems to be to create another platform where you can actually discuss the same issues or similar issues the problem of course then comes is, is that generally i don't i don't know but taiwan i think you're probably more engaged but in the uk the the general population are very disengaged with politics because it's just one of those things that happens and we just put up with it so <clears throat> that's that's possibly an issue but when you've got a local problem like we have with these so, so in, in, to put it in context, I live in a village with about 850 houses, and it's evolved over the years. So we have we don't have roads; we have lanes, and they're, they're the width of a good tractor. So one the modern tractor completely fills the lane, and so we've got 850 houses connected with these lanes. And there's a few you could arguably say two two lane, but most of them are one lane because they've got cars parked along. So it's, there's a restriction there with the infrastructure. And we are currently fighting 250 houses extra. And it's just not going mean, to, it's not going to work. But we've got no, no alternative. We've got no way to debate an alternative. Um, and when you discuss it with local people, they say, well, what can we do? And I said, well, at least we could just plan what we want and present at least we've got a starting point, but we don't even have that. So there's there's a there's a there's a gap 
um, to my mind, a gap in our deliberative processes, not just for the, the, the way we deliberate, but in the places and how we deliberate. So the Sunflower Movement was a, was a great um, uh, example of how it might be done differently. So I set up a group to, to have a look at this challenge using the Sunflower model as a mirroring and then we needed a decision making process. How are we going to make decisions? So that's where I came up with this. Let's let's try and hook it in with the system. You f familiar with systems theory? Mm -hmm. Yeah, sure. Yeah. So so if we hooked it into systems theory and we could then get a bigger picture and say, well, actually, why we what are we doing first and why are we doing it? And then when you've come up with a proposal, we can actually examine that proposal and say, well, what are the effects of that proposal? What are the knock-on effects, the unseen mm -hmm. side effects? Mm -hmm. and, and if we record them, then we can debate them later, at a later stage. Mm -hmm. We could actually invite experts in because we're going to find places where we don't have knowledge most of the time. And so we could, we could then have this deliberation, get as far as we can, uh, and then say, well, we need, we need experts. We need to understand the data. We need to find the truth because there's... What tends to happen in, in these, and well, we've had a few meetings recently, they get very heated mm -hmm. and people come up with their version of why it's blame it on you know, the capitalists, the immigrants, uh, the lazy folk, whatever. <laughs> Some, so let's look at the actual, the truth. What is that? What are the figures? What are the figures of immigration, emigration? What are the figures for capitalism? And, you know, let's look at the numbers. And within our community, we probably don't have the expertise, so, but we can call on the expertise. Um, what came out of that was then if we had a deliberating process, say, in our village, and we recorded it, and we recorded it next to the, uh, as a, in, a, in a structure that identified the systems that we're connecting to, any other community, if they came up with a similar issue, could say as soon as they punch in um, land, building, housing shortage, our deliberation can also come up and they can see what we've done. And so that could that could knock on and knock on and knock on and knock on. Um, so that's I think that's the core of what what I'm trying. We don't have the software. I've been playing with the. Um, the schema. Mm -hmm. um, I've got a background in linguistics and database mm -hmm. stuff, so that's happy territory for me. Um, but again, you, again, you come up with how far do you normalise and how for efficiency, how far do you do you do you normalise the the data or how 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 vague do you make it so that it still works? So there's a there's there's a, there's a place to to sort out where what's efficient and what's not efficient. So that's it's. The structure I've sort of got, um, but I'm not sure until it's tried and tested. I, I, I don't know whether it's the right structure. And we don't have the software. So mm -hmm. <laughs> lots of catch 22s. Mm. And I don't know, I don't, I, I'm not quite sure how your, the, the, the system you have with the parallel mm -hmm. mirror, quite how that works and whether there's any prompts for. Um, where you're out of your depth, and do you ask somebody else, and how you how you work with all that, or how you structure it at all? Well, um, it's almost entirely dependent on the size of the group, how well the group knows each other, and how far physically are the group members from each other, how their life experiences overlap. Mm, those three factors can almost determine uh, the tool that we use uh, to facilitate the, the process. Um, for tightly knit groups, like a hundred people or less, who already know each other, um, digital tools are just for archival. It's just for recording, as you said, uh, for yeah. like-minded um, groups or for follow-up discussions. But what's really key at that scale is professional facilitation. Uh, it is a facilitator that can get people into the right emotion, uh, which is after everybody 
share their life experience, their story, their narratives told, get into the sense of okay, so we have very different life experiences, but are there some common values? And and so this facilitation we found was the key to small group who already yeah.、Uh, share some life experience.、Um, my main work is on how to create empathy among groups who. Share no life experience at all, who have no、um, personal connection to speak of,、uh, to each other,、uh, and using language of experts of different domains, and to kind of put them on a shared mind map, so that everybody、yep. can understand the issue at hand, but using the vocabulary and structure that they are comfortable with. So it is a little bit like simultaneous interpretation, but not between languages, but rather <laughs> between worldviews.、Um, and、yep. so, so that's the main work. But for a、um, hundred people or less who already know each other and share the same language, like British English,、uh, that's overkill,、uh, to be frank.、Mm. Yeah. So、um, normally, a like weekly or biweekly. Gathering a ongoing relationship,、um, plenty of food, <laughs> which people can bring by themselves, a, a good recording or capturing device is all you need.、Uh, and the, the capturing device could be、uh, this course is pretty popular for very tight knit groups. Lumio is even better, and so there are already ready made tools for exactly this purpose、uh, for、um, capturing structured data and. Um, the context.、Um, so yeah, that that's the main、uh, feedback I have because it seems that in your case, most people share somewhat similar experiences. Until you scale up, and then it gets then it gets more diverse,、mm-hmm. or until there's there's vested interest, which is which is a an issue.、Mm-hmm. Um, going back to my example here. The the people that turn up in the meeting are generally the articulate, the confident, the the, the comfortable,、mm. uh, and arguably the wealthy. That's not not so true. The last one's not so true. But the and I don't know. The demographic is definitely not representative of the community.、Mm. That's, that's the bottom line. And the question, my question, re- my 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 concern really is how we get. A representative quorum、mm. Mm. matches the demographic.、Mm. That's the hard part. Well, I'm not sure about statistical representation because even if you do sortition、um, and get a demographically sound part, that's just the first half of the problem. The second half is to get the people who share the demographic who did not get. Chosen for the sortition or invited to the quorum, to somehow accept the result as something that they're willing to get along with, that they're okay to live with, because、yeah. um, no decisions about it without us, right? So、um, anyone who can claim to be a stakeholder but did not get discovered or was not、uh, drawn in the sortition. Or someone who shares their background did get drawn into the sortition, but they don't have the、um, rhetorics and oratory skills, and so they lost the argument, and so on. All those different、um, conditions may arise that makes the statistical representation void.、Um, now, of course, if you compare it to the representative democratic system, arguably you can say, well, but that's still useful input to the MPs, and and. To that degree, everybody would would agree. Like this is useful input, this is useful agenda setting. This determines what may be overlooked by the MPs and their crew, or the city council and the crew. To this point, everybody will will agree. But if you try to replace even part of the、uh, policy making or budget making power、uh, of the existing representative system, then、um, just statistical representation or statistical representativeness. It's not enough because it does not factor in, as I said, the capability of propagation back to the community, as well as the still unequal rhetoric skill of the people who did get chosen for the quorum. Hmm. Yeah. 
You sure about that? <laughs> I'm pretty pretty sure about it. Um, yeah, uh, there's quite a few examples that I've personally worked with, uh, and we kind of went with a hybrid model, where we get stakeholders, experts, uh, so-called representatives from communities, deliberating in one room of maybe 30 people, and have a town hall where hundreds, thousands of people can watch the live stream of the experts doing the deliberation. And so it's a one-way live stream because um, the town hall, there may be people who want to protest, there may be people who want to derail the discussion, but I'm uh, personally in the town hall part. So, so they can come to me and make their point or make their um, voice heard on a uh, pretty good platform called Slido, uh, S-L-I-D-O, designed for this kind of real-time um, crowdsourced agenda. But the smaller room, which is being broadcasted to the larger room, um, gets to focus on the discussion at hand um, uninterrupted. And so my role is like a, I don't know, ESPN anchor or something who explains what happens in the smaller room, live stream to the larger room, to the larger town hall people, so that they know uh, in their layperson's language what's at play for each play, each move that the experts make uh, in the smaller room. But in this experts room, we don't mean academic experts only. We mean people with life experience that are generally um, honored and recognized and so on. And people in the town hall can see that their group of person performing in real time and informing their discussion uh, through asynchronous and online participation. So that's one of the ways that we try to maintain both the scale and the quality of the discussion. Uh, but still, with this arrangement, it accommodates maybe to 1,000 people. Uh, scaling beyond that, we don't have a very good experience. Scaling beyond 1,000 people, we resort back to AI power conversations, which um, is crowdsourced, but it's almost text only. There's very little supporting material, and so we can only do the um, problem discovery part and check each other's feelings in design thinking terms. That's just first quarter or a little bit over first quarter of the first diamond. But everything else, the how may we questions and so on, we still have to do it face to face. Um, there's some active research going on in virtual reality and so on, but I would say they're not mature for this purpose for at least another two or three years. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, the other the other problem is that quite often you you any any technical um, solution cuts people out because they don't have the internet. You know, and, and there's still quite a few. I don't know what the percentage is, but you know, it's it's immeasurable. But cer certainly here, um, there's a measurable percentage that just don't have the internet and don't want to have the internet. Well, certainly you can bring the internet to them, though. You just can. organize a offline meeting and then make sure that it's well captured. Uh, like yeah. we did in rural Ireland, um, we capture everything in 360 video, but we had to post-process it and upload it afterwards. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so how do you bootstrap something like that from here? Hmm. Well, <laughs> Taiwan, Taiwan has kind of um, a very recent history with democracy, right? We only had democracy for 30 years. So I still remember the martial law. So um, for us, democracy is a very new thing, as is the World Web. And so because of this, it's somewhat easier because people find that there is so much room to experiment with. They don't yeah. think democracy as just some other process because this is a very new thing to us. Um, and in the UK, um, far as I understand, uh, because I'm traveling, as I mentioned, uh, to Edinburgh, uh, later um, next week, um, they share this model of the so-called Highland and Island uh, Development Agency. Uh, yeah. Um, which there's a lot of grassroots organizing, but they still use technology, the social technology, uh, to yeah. empower the local decision making by essentially putting more and more of the building in the commons and have the decision making 
power vested, especially to the younger generation, but also to people who are um, invested their life, their career, to the development, the betterment of this region in general, but just not to them personally. And so I think it's been quite well known in the um, international social enterprise community as a worked model. Uh, but I don't know how, how well versed uh, you are in this community organization effort. I'm, I'm familiar, I'm familiar with it. I know of it, but like that. And in some ways, the Highlands are probably because of their situation um, and the necessity. They've needed to, to get the communications because they're very dispread out and it's, it's actually That's difficult right. to, exactly. to get to yeah. be. Um, so they've had to facilitate it in some ways. And in, in many ways, they leapfrogged the, the, the UK, the rest of the UK, England and, and Wales. I don't, Wales is actually, um, there's some interesting things going on in Wales for much the same reason. You know, it's been mm. marginalised and it's difficult to, to get from, from your neighbour to neighbour. They're not all next door. They're not walking distance. Mm. So, so they've had to um, leverage technology to, to actually get things done. And the knock-on effect of that is actually they've got a, I think, a, a, a more connected, more mm -hmm. um, engaged community with decision making. Whereas in the in the bulk of the UK, we just go, yeah, it's going to happen, and yeah, okay, fine, let me get on with the rest of my life. And people are disengaged. I mean, worse than that, that they're um, Probably because the only the only thing that they know how to do is to object. That's we tend to do that all the time. Mm. That's our modus operandi. Mm. So the, the unfortunate side effect, and going back to the to the the situation here, is that the local council. So we have the parish council, which is the very local council, and then we have the district council, which is the next level up, and they're both seen as the enemy. So that's not. <laughs> not helpful and it's we, we to my mind we need to find some way to 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 break that them and us so that it's just us no, it's mm. not them and us. Well, so have anyone in the nearby city council or, or whatever tried um, for example participatory budgeting or any of those new devices that connects the the people who object with people who make the decisions uh, no. Okay. Not, not that I'm aware of. Hmm. Well, then, then I think the most practical way is just to find a friendly or at least attentive um, person with facilitation training or with social work training that often helps and so on uh, in the local city um, bureaucracy. Uh, if the council is not helping, often the uh, career public servants are sympathizing um, with it. But, but, I mean, they're largely anonymous, so they probably would not come out and just say, you know, I think there should be more local engagement. But surely there must be someone um, in a correct position uh, to start piloting a, a dialogue to break the ice, so to speak. Um, you can import facilitators from anywhere, even from the Highland Islands, but uh, it really needs buy-in, at least from a, a career public servant in the city um, to start even uh, turning the wheel, so to speak. If the council, as you mentioned, is generally seen as the enemy, at least some people would still trust, for example, people working in the I don't know, statistics department, people working in the planning department and things like that because they're career public servants. Yeah, I think the problem, I mean, I, I'm, I'm guessing on, on um, ish, problems looking ahead, I'm not looking for problems, but I'm, I suspect that the, I don't know, it would be an interesting one to, because to, I can think of a couple of names and I think they might feel... Be interesting to try because they might feel they might like conflicted interest, conflict of interest. Not sure. That's, that's a good one to, to look at. Yeah. No, I, I'm not talking about forcing them to make uh, a change to the no, no, decision making no. process. I'm just saying building a report, like like just trust between people. Yeah, that's a good good point. So. 
I'd be interested to hear what you what your, what are your thoughts about the sort of system side of it, um, because I, I I see that as quite important um, as a way of of explaining the bigger picture to people, mm-hmm. because we we are faced with some huge issues that um, most people I talk to go, well, what can we do about it? <laughs> And they don't think there is, there is, I think, you know, the only way we're going to do it, do anything about all these, you know, pollution, climate change, I mean, there's a, the list, the list is big, mm. biodiversity, um, and they're all connected. And they seem to be so big that we, we can, we can, we can't do anything about them. Mm. And so it's left to um, governments to make agreements, and we can we've seen what happens when someone like America, for example, pulls out, mm-hmm. stops. So how you know I'm because I'm thinking if if we had this had a system like the one you've got and it was scalable, mm. and I think there's the issue where you're saying about the scalable and how do you scale with. Because the only way you can, I can see you can actually scale is to have some form of representation, mm-hmm. the line. Um, at some level you're going to need, because you can't just have everybody connected saying we, we should do this and we should do that. But mm-hmm. there is some way of scaling where we can actually engage the public to understand the issues and then make and and get buy-in for the solutions because that's the that's that's the hardest part it doesn't it does i mean we got well i think we've got more buy-in for example now with plastic you know people mm. understand and that's due to a, yeah. a tele- program right. you know people understand it so now the, the tide is shifting a bit where people are looking at things in, encased in plastic and saying well actually i'd rather buy that without the plastic so that it mm. is happening but whether it's happening it's at the right sufficient speed i'm not sure mm. well i think um there's three kinds of scaling i i like to um mention um there is of course horizontal scaling scaling out and you're correct in saying that there needs to be some kind of model if not representation outright at least some delegates like small world network uh, to maintain when you scale out. There's also scaling up, uh, which is a single message reinforced and more and more people join like in a traditional social movement. Uh, for yeah. that, you don't need that much representation. You just need a actionable, connected, extensible message. That That's all you need uh, to, to scale yeah. up. But of course, it's kind of narrow. It's not all the sustainable development goals here. It, it could be, it would be just one, uh, and and a very single, simple one at that, like the I don't know ice bucket challenge, or me too, yeah. or or whatever. Uh, and yeah. and it, it's pretty good at scaling up, right? Um, and um, there's a, the third dimension, which I often mention as scaling deeply, uh, meaning that um, in places where the cross sectoral relationship is absent or toxic, um, one can scale deeply meaning, um, get fellows from each sector related to that problem to be in the shoes of the other stakeholders at play um, by just shipping people around, having fellowship, building rapport, sharing food, uh, and so on. And, And that scales in a deep way, meaning um, if you have a, for example, university that embarks on a social responsibility program that have their students solve social problems as part of the course, then it actually determines how those students view the world um, down the line, maybe for the next 30 years or so. Uh, and scaling deeply only works, of course, in formative years, um, because it's very hard to change someone's worldview without resorting to um, like existential therapy level stuff. Um, and that also works. So I, I'm not saying that adults are hopeless. I'm just saying it's much easier <laughs> if you start sure, in, bas- sure. in basic education in the college. Uh, you can see my doubtful looking face there. 
Uh, right. I mean, I'm 37 now, so I'm hope hopelessly optimistic. Uh, I, I don't think anything will change that uh, as part of my core personality. But what, what I'm saying is that that's because I joined the World Web and the open source development in its formative days. And, and so that ethics I carry with me, no matter where I go. And that's what I mean by scaling deeply. And so I think education is a large part of it. But it's not education system or institute per se, but just getting kids in the habit of doing meaningful environmental and social work and identifying with the purpose, but not the instrument or the skill or the tools. And that's the, the third dimension I would like to mention, which also scale, scales, but you just need to wait longer. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, that's the, that goes back to the education thing, which, again, you know, takes time, doesn't it? I mean, part part of my thinking with the with the process I've, I've been designing is that if you if you collect a lot of people say we've you know we've got an issue say with, with housing, take yeah. this example as a real example, <clears throat> and you actually then say well okay what what are the causes of this? It gets people thinking, and it's it's a for, it's a it's a sort of critical thinking, but at a very basic level. Um, but once that's started, and then you say, well, okay, well, that's so you think that's it doesn't matter whether it is the cause so much, but if you think it's the cause, then we can discuss it. You might want to discuss it with, um, so say, so, say we are you familiar, probably familiar with, with World Cafe and Open sure, Space. Yeah, yeah. So, so World Cafe does have a, they both got their different advantages. World Cafe is quite useful in that it can help people who don't feel comfortable in, the, in large groups to. To actually participate, mm -hmm. and it get little discussions going there. So, once you start looking at the cause, then you can say, well, okay, what's the cause of that? And this is the Socratic questioning. You, and and until you get, you could ask them or say, well, you know, when we're doing this 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 discovery, until you can get back to nature says it so, then you can find a cause that we can do something about, perhaps mm. depending on the circumstance. And that that opens up a lot of a lot of thinking. Well, actually, what we've got now is not necessarily a given. So, what could we do to make it better? Whether mm. we can is, is not so much important, but it's the education, and the understanding, and likewise in the essay when somebody comes up with a proposal, you say, well, what are the what are the knock-on effects of this proposal? What are the actual what's actually going to happen? You know, mm. the cost, consumption, and materials and um, the, the societal harm necessarily, and so on and so forth. So it's a form of education. To me, I mean, again, I'm, I don't know. I've never really tried it yet. That's worked, but I have tried it. It's not worked. But that's yeah, in, in my in my um, defence. I tried it as a as a, a pro, for a protest group. And when you've got mm. a protest group, it's all they want to do is protest. They don't want mm. to hear the other side. Mm. So. <clears throat> I think in a, in a, if you if you can get it neutral and say okay we've got this issue let's just have a get all the people to talk about it and once you start looking at the knock on effects of the proposals you can see because we're you know we don't have much room for maneuver now mm. whatever whatever we decide to do and think and I was looking at a thing uh, today about Greece have have got a smart city. And there's all, they were doing all sorts of things, and they all sound good, but I'm just thinking about, well, actually, some of that doesn't sound too good. It sounds like a good idea and good fun, mm. but where's the power going to come from? Where's the people going to come from? We know where, Where's the employment going to come from? Because that's a big issue. And so there's all these knock-on effects. If you get automated vehicles, you've effectively done people out of a job. So it's, it's a, it's, I think the structure would help people understand situation as much as uh, you know, the, the bigger picture. Yeah, and, and in my office uh, in Taipei is called Social Innovation Lab. Um, we, we have autonomous vehicles uh, on trial uh, and it's an experiment um, and they're tricycles. They're just slow-ish tricycles. And I live just close to this Jianguo flower market and they solve a very real social problem which is elderly people strolling along the central park of Taipei 
of the Dian Forest Park, go into flower market, bought a lot of flowers, pots and things like that, and they're kind of heavy, but they don't want to rent a taxi because it's just, you know, 15 minutes walks away and um, and they, they want to keep shopping, right? They don't want to be dragged down. And um, so there's just so much they can do uh, with the autonomy uh, without enlisting, I don't know, their grandchildren or something. So, so having a tricycle that just accompany them uh, and you can just put stuff on it. And at the end of it, you can just hop on it and drive to home. Um, it, it's actually very helpful. Um, I, I don't think it made anyone lose any jobs. Um, I think it is a purely socially beneficial device. Uh, yeah. But I think, I think it's worth asking the question. Uh. So, so, you, so I, mean, I don't want to go necessarily on the specifics, but mm. so on that particular one, and you, you actually said they don't want to ask their friends and family. Mm -hmm. So there's a connection. They've lost. A, they've lost a reason to make that connection. So that could have a knock-on effect. No, but if they ask their family, but their family is just there to help picking and carrying stuff, then they can't do as much as real conversation as they would do if they have invited on a normal a company trip. You know, it is the taking the trivial part out of the connection because I don't think the, the grandchildren or teenagers are very happy if they're just reduced to, you know, a, a carrier or something. Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. 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 So, so that, that, that's what I mean by, by kind of equalizing um, the relationship between humans uh, by automating part of the work that is not a seen as a desirable job, uh, but as a kind of, I don't know, uh, filial piety. I, I know this concept doesn't quite mean as much in, in the UK, but yeah, um, something a obligation to your family. So, so it, it makes the family dynamic more more dynamic. Is what all what I'm saying. Um, so I, I don't think it really deprives any social connection. But again, we're just on on field trial here. But what what I'm going on is. Um, because this is open source technology and the local students loves to modify the build and it's slow enough, it collects useful data, open data, but it doesn't hurt anyone, even if it runs into something. It has the right to road as any pedestrian. And so we, we're, we're basically saying, you know, these kind of autonomous vehicles are the key to deepen the understanding between AI and collective intelligence. And instead of seeing something that you know pulls them apart, it, it ties them together. It may may not be the perfect example, but it's the one that springs to my mind. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But you understand what I'm saying about asking those other questions that, that you know it's useful to ask them because it's very easy to get beguiled into thinking this is wonderful because They're very very much so. So so we really need to do quantitative studies before and after, yeah. and that that's why we run experiments. Yeah. 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 Um, right. So, so, given what we've talked about, how how can we? And we, apart from this, it, apart from the um, the human side, where I can I, I can find the right people to. I mean, facilitators isn't so much a problem because it's open open space technologies. There's enough people that understand that stuff, um, probably to be able to 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 get somebody to facilitate and that's less of an issue um, but c engaging with the authorities on, on that I'm going to have to give that some thought um, the deep thing is is or, or the, the long term thing I'm, is if I am going to use this structure with um, issues causes and effects proposals and effects mm. and ratings um, is how because you mentioned Lumio it has some of that but it doesn't have that structure mm -hmm. um, it's getting the software to what what software would, would be available to you I mean I, the only thing I can think is to build some mm. build it from scratch well Again. Um, we're, we're, we're working on some early prototypes the one we actually use day to day is called Real Time Board, but Real Time Board is just post-it notes online collaboratively, yeah. Uh, yeah. and so it all depends on how you organize those post-it notes. 
uh, and that takes skill. Uh, and we use the actually the Policy Lab UK um, policy making toolkit, um, and and their way of using the post-it notes. Uh, so at least that's something that your government invented and therefore should understand. Uh, but uh, I, I think the policy lab people, um, the policy uh, toolkit the lab developed is worth looking into if just for the shared vocabulary. Because as career public servants, they're kind of required to know this stuff. Uh, that's policy lab UK. Um, and um, we're developing ourselves, as you said, in-house uh, quite a few software to automate the process of just putting post-it notes of the right color on the right points um, to connect the cause and effect and effects and stakeholders and so on. Um, and there's currently two uh, efforts in Taiwan, uh, but they're both, I think, being developed um, in a kind of early stages. Uh, one is called Sense, Sense.tw, uh, which is just, you know, making sense of something. So Sense.tw. Um, and it's trying to basically link, um, I don't know whether you know the idea of web annotations, uh, which is a web uh, standard that you can take a PDF file, a local development planning picture, a website, whatever, and start highlighting and annotating uh, any part of it without the support from the site yeah. administrator. It's an overlay. Right. So yeah. what, what it tries to do... There's a Firefox plugin that does that, I think. That, that's exactly right. So Sense is trying to turn that overlay and mark it with the cause and effect lines, as you said, and make a mind map out of it. So you can have a bird's eye view, but you can also zoom in to the actual sources where those um, evidences or uh, facts or whatever are being presented. And so that's Sense TW's project. Yeah. Structure. The, again, the, 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 the thing I think is the first thing that comes to mind there is that effectively you've got to create the, the back to the curated library thing, which is great if you've got lots of create cur, curators. Um, and what I'm what I'm sort of aiming for is that this the process is self curating. Yeah. Um, so the, the other thing is uh, Wiccan, W I K U M. Um, <laughs> Wiccan, so uh, it's yeah. like wiki and a forum, uh, so yeah. so so it calls itself Wiccan, uh, and what what it does is that you take a unstructured conversation, as you said, Lumio, discourse, Reddit, you name it, but then it recursively enables people who participate to build mind maps that summarize fragments of discussions until you have a bird's eye picture. So unlike Sense TW, it doesn't come from library or citation or sources, but it comes from a live dialogue uh, that takes place in a threaded discussion. Uh, and the author is now working on putting the same technology to Slack, which is kind of different, right? Because it's real time and it's uh, far more back and forth than a forum, which uh, it tends to be self-containing. But if they solve it for Slack, then it also solves for capture transcript of face-to-face -face open space technology because it's like Slack if you type it down, right? So so we can, I think it's also something you can look into. That that's just to... W-I-K-U-M. W-I-K-U-M. K-U-M. Yeah. Come across that, don't we? It's from Emmy Chang. So yeah, W I K U M. I think that I think that you know I'm I'm old school. I'm XML schema, you know that sort of technology where it's predefined, um, which has its issues. Obviously, if you pre you know, at some point you have to define your categories somewhere along the line. Eventually, you've got to you've got to give them field names somehow. And that's, that's the conundrum, whether you start with field names or whether you have a general concept field fields as opposed to field specific field names. Um, and I've gone for the specific field names in a sort of general sense. So the specific field name would be issue or 
actually the specific name, field name there was be point of interest type as issue. So because they're all points of interest on the on a system or a cycle. So it's fairly fairly generic. I mean the other going the other thing I, I'm I'm hope if it if I pursue this, which is another question altogether, um, is that you could have a place for um, somebody who comes up with a solution for an issue and says, well, I'd like to store this and, and enter it into a database so that, so that people can actually use it and, and benefit from it. And they could do that too, but it would ask them what issue and what, what, what cycle it's, what part of what cycle it's trying to address. Um, so that it could actually act as a sort of potentially global repository. And there's more, there's, you know, I, I could talk to you about it for hours, but <clears throat> um, there's, there's the other aspect, or another aspect of it is that um, going on this, like the domain name registrars model, you could have multiple registrars of this data who could do their own manipulation of it if they wanted to and examine it in their own way. Or even if, if there's a, because again, you and I are talking from a from a place of a democracy. There are places where they don't have democracy, and it's it's not so easy to do what we're talking about. So the model I've, I've, I think would work in places of, of slightly more or more strife, because it enables communities to do it uh, in a sort of protected way, so they don't have to connect to some central server, so they can actually run it from their smartphones. And then they can put it in one of these repositories, and they can learn from. You know, so, that, so, so there is, is there other aspect of it, hmm. um, which I can discuss if you want to. But yeah, the, I have a bunch of friends who's working on it. Um, uh, they call themselves the Secure Scuttlebutt Consortium. Uh, they're in New Zealand, uh, and they're doing something that's. Um, well, I, I've pasted you the link, but um, the the idea, very simply put, and I think Mozilla has uh, some support of it now, but it is exactly as you said, a distributed, secure, uh, offline, capable, um, LAN-enabled peer-to-peer social network, yep. Uh, yep. and and they have built a lot of infrastructure so that you can do Git development on it and if you can do git development on it then you can do everything really because then everything else on top of it is just a overlay and so mm -hmm. if you want to build an application this this could save you some time is what I, what i'm saying mm. Mm. yeah certainly would i mean and again you know it could be you they could my thinking is that they could output their meeting data as an xml file Validated against the schema, yeah. Stick it anywhere on any public space, and then the, the the bots, if when they arrive and when some people build them, can search for these XML slugs, in, incorporate them, and they've got the data. Right, right. Uh, and so the schema we are using for our deliberation uh, is called uh, Akoman Toso, uh, which is a proper XML uh, vocabulary. Uh, for parliamentary, legislative, and judiciary documents, but it just so happens it can work for deliberations as well. Uh, and the primary, the flagship product of the Akama and Tosa movement is also a UK product called Say It. Uh, and Say It uh, is a My Society project. Uh, and I keep all my meeting records uh, in Say It. And, and I think the, the good thing about this is that um, just as you said, um, if I have a meeting transcript, say this one, I just append dot .an uh, after it to get the XML representation. And so it, people are not restricted to the visualization. People can do a lot of cross culture, even comparisons, uh, like mm. compare between constitutions, compare between judiciary decisions. And so on, based on the uh, Akamon Toso vocabulary. So that's also a useful foundation uh, to build on. <laughs> Let me give you a link to mine then.
I mean, this is uh, very early, very early days. Second one. So this is this came from a hackathon um, in Cape Town meeting, mm. um, which again it, it was it was very linear. It was mm. it was done in um, in discourse actually, in, in, but in an o OSC days, but it was mm. used discourse within that, um, and of mm. course you lose stuff, it gets disappears. So that's that's it. But styled at XMR, so I don't know what you're what you're viewing it on. You'll probably see, mm -hmm. but if you you, you you view source and see it's got. Mm -hmm. it's yeah, I think this is pretty good um, as a. As a way to uh, capture the um, proposal at the issue level, um, I think this is pretty good. And I've got a give you. A, I've got a document I can which I've been playing with, um, which probably explains a bit more. I mean, it's, inter it's very interesting talking to you because this, this is the first time I've talked to people who under seem to understand the biggest, bigger picture of what's going on. Um, and I've done this pretty, pretty much for a long time in a, in a sort of vacuum. <laughs> so, um, yeah, I called it climate change because it's... Documents on this guy, can't we? Have you eaten? I'm sorry? Have you eaten? I'm not holding up your supper. Nah, uh, it's fine, yeah. I eat um, XML tag suit. <laughs> It's good because most people go XML, but it's dead. That's right. Which it isn't. It's very much alive. It's just not visible. It's just become, you know, like democracy in the old democracies. <laughs> it just yeah. functions in the background. Yeah. I mean, in many ways, I had I had a sort of a, 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 a useful grounding in because I started with PostScript um, trying to do stuff on printers and I don't know we've come across PostScript I mean, is that PostScript is, is actually the where PDFs came from mm -hmm. it was the pre pre PDF is just an encapsulated version of PostScript mm -hmm. before, this is before the web mm -hmm. and then from there, I went straight into XML because I was trying to do something with the mobile phones, and they had a thing called WAP. Mm -hmm. Again, it disappeared. Mm. Technology overtook me. Yeah, I, I started coding in '89, so I still remember the, the days before the web. Yeah, yeah what were you coding in? Um, basic. Back at the time, well, logo, of course, but also basic, yes. Mm. Yeah. Well, I, I've got friends who started in assembler. Hmm. <laughs> yeah. Which is, a, which is a form of madness, I think. Yeah, I learned that much later. Uh, it's not my native language. I didn't even bother. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I don't remember punch cards either. So <laughs> we're, we're the relatively personal computerized generation. Well, I think, I mean, we're, we're, di we're digressing slightly, but there was a very interesting chap called Richard Feynman, probably mm -hmm. heard of, mm -hmm. um, and he fought for a while to keep one of the old computers going that was that was analog, mm. had an analog weather computer, and for a long time it was much better because it had no steplets mm. because it was analog. Mm. 
and I think there's 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 a there's something there that I think we might have missed. I think there's a, mm. there's something useful there about that that because um, digital is always there's always steps somewhere you could have defined your resolution. Mm. Whereas analog, it's it's at an atomic level, you know, what is I don't know quantum level. I don't know what level it is. But it's it's very deep. I've I've encounter a fabulous education tool. I don't know whether you know it or not. It's a computer game called Democracy Three. Um, <laughs> no, <laughs> no you no, you are kidding me. Uh, and its user interface is um, like eighty uh, percent the same, similar as the document as you just sent me. Uh, it shows through green lines, reinforcing causing effect, through red lines, a uh, negative externality. Um, and the speed uh, corresponds to how fast um, it's affecting other externalities. And it has a very detailed policy model of the populations uh, affected by policies. And you can also add on some, you know, downloadable pacts such as social engineering, or clones and drones, or electioneering, or Africa. So um, I, I found this as an extremely good education tool, so much so that I made a mod for Taiwan using our National Development Council's data, just so that I can explain policies. Um, um, and I think this is a good way, if not accurate, for actual policy making, to get everybody on the mindset of system thinking. Yeah, 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 yeah. That's, that's very important. I mean, the thing I haven't mentioned, which actually I'm not sure it, it is entirely relevant. And tell me when you when you've got to go, because I can I can talk to you for another couple of days. I think hmm. um, is when I started looking at this, thinking well, um, and it, I I like I like to go back, not quite to assembler, but somewhere close. Hmm. So looking at something, I need to. I like to like to um, like to. Uh, there's, there's a link there. Grab the Google link. Um, understand the, the you know the causation, as I said. So when you go back and you go back and you go back, and I think, well, you know, let's look at our history. And most people go back to the Napole Napoleonic. They might go back to the Middle Ages. They might go back to the Dark Ages. Mm -hmm. But actually, if you, you to to see where we with the inflection, the inflection point is ten thousand years ago. Mm -hmm. And there's an awful lot of interest. I I, I think I don't know whether it, you, it'll be of interest to you, but. Mm -hmm. There's, a, there's an awful lot of um, changes, and there's a couple of books. I can give you some books as well, mm -hmm. if you want. Mm -hmm. uh, that illustrate what happens, and it's a mindset thing. Mm. Yeah, so we have this we have this sort of duality of um, nurturing empathy, and as you were saying about getting getting people on board in that mm. frame of mind helps in the meeting. Otherwise, they're competing for their square or their mm. circle space or their whatever. And and they don't know they're doing it. People don't know they're doing it. They don't know they're in um, sort of war footing or, or or loving footing. You know, there's these two two footings. And what happened when when I, 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 there's lots of arguments about why we we went from agrar from hunter gatherer to agrarian. Mm -hmm. you know, the jury's still out on that. But what happened was that suddenly things had value and worth, whereas they weren't exactly worthless before, but they weren't ascribed a value you could then park it and say it's worth that much. Mm. So my, this year's harvest, it, I know how long it's taken me, how much it hurt, how much the work, effort and so on. So in my head it's worth, I've got the figure and I can see mm. what the equivalent is. And it's mine. <laughs> Which is a very different mindset to um, so so you were you were, you were talking about in the meetings where people bring food, mm. and if somebody goes to a table and and, and part gets a plate and piles it so he can't get anything more on the plate, he'll get looks from other people, and, mm. and he won't. And 
And if he started filling his pockets as well, somebody would say something. Mm. Whereas if it's if it's when it's converted to money and a token, it's then not connected with any sort of emotional worth. Mm. Somehow it seems okay to collect it and hoard it and gather mm. more. And it's a very different mm. mindset. Mm. So there's some there's there's some really interesting um, understandings I think from the from the Bushmen, and there's yeah. a lovely mm -hmm. another another one. Mm -hmm. This is my this is my favourite subject at the moment. So do tell me when I'm boring, otherwise I'll just carry mm -hmm. on. Um, there's a lovely story of <laughs> say East meets West. It's not East meets West, but it's that sort of thing where an anthropologist fell foul of the sort of the, the innate rules that he didn't understand. Um, extract for this. Yeah. Yeah. This isn't. This is an extract from a book by an, a previous, an, an earlier anthropologist, um, where he. He falls foul of the of the unwritten rules. It's a lovely story, mm -hmm. and he should have known, really, but he didn't. You know, this is part of his anthropology. He should have really understood what he was doing, but but didn't. Mm -hmm. And he had to explain to him in simple words. And they have this thing they call it cursing the meat, which mm -hmm. is a, a way of. Um, as he, as the previous writer, um, Sus, James Sussman, um, calls, calls it fiercely egalitarian. So they are fiercely egalitarian. They will actually, um, rather than just expect it, they will actually enforce it, which is which is unusual. And I'm, I'm not sure you'd get away with that today, and in, in our our current culture, it's it's sort of counterintuitive. Well, there's um, many parallels in that. Um, like recently, a um, like Taiwan has a trade agreement with New Zealand, but within that trade agreement, there's a parallel chapter between the Maori people and the indigenous people here, because uh, all of the Austronesian and Polynesian culture they came out from Taiwan, so Taiwan is like the originating place uh, for them, for the language and um, the, the cultures. And in Taiwan, we have more than a dozen nations of indigenous people, some still pretty much around, and they have a like separate diplomatic track with the Maori people. So recently, just a, a, a bunch of Maori people came and uh, to kind of visit their, their um, uh, heritage, their, their ancestry. Um, uh, I, I think part of um, the lure of this is that a lot of the culture you just described is fiercely egalitarian culture. Um, in some nations, it's um, matriarchal, so it's not without its gender biases, but sure. uh, but with good um, environmental um, consciousness, and the consciousness mm -hmm. is. Uh, permeating to everything they do, not just uh, for the sake of the environment, but uh, it's oh, part part of their part of their identity. Uh, and so, and so, so all this, you know, is without the help of quote unquote sustainable development goals or quote unquote social enterprises, because that's part of their national identity. And so, a lot of what we do here in Taiwan is just to honor the the nations as they are, and also. Unlearn what we do um, from a Han ethnic, very much currency, financial, trade oriented culture uh, to the ways of living of the still very much living indigenous um, people. And I think um, that is also one of the, I think, very useful ways to think about it because then these people, they also all over Polynesia and all the way to Madagascar, I think, all, all yeah, share yeah. similar lifestyles. Yeah, yeah, did. Yeah. Yeah. Well, still do, um, and many of them are still like uh, reinvigorating. Uh, when I came to New Zealand, I visited three times uh, in the past two years. Many different places there, just revitalizing this because they realized that maybe the shortcut 
uh, the because their constitution is the treaty, right? Uh, so they have to honor, for example, the Maori people consider a river have a personhood. So they actually give that river legal personhood, so yeah. they can take place in you know board meetings and and things like that. And I think all this helps us to anthropomorph anthropomorphize the externalities. Yes, yeah. yes, anthropomorphize the the externalities, the negative externalities, so that we can all see that we're, we're harming the river, which is not a river god like like some Shinto belief that it helps to think in Shinto beliefs and in Maori and in indigenous cultures. Yeah. 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 I mean, I, I'm going I'm to, I'll, I'll throw in a, a, um, a curveball into that lot because when you look at the, the, the early migrations, actually the ones that, that where the Maoris came out of that branch and the later and the Native Native American branch, they actually caused a huge amount of damage. No, of course, as soon as I want to do. <laughs> well, I, it's not so much that I think it's because the. The, the 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 tribes that are in the if you look at the megafauna loss in in Africa it's far less than anywhere else because what happened that the megafauna and the humans evolved together so the megafauna in Africa were aware of how dangerous humans were and they avoided them hmm. whereas when when they landed when the then then humans landed in you know uh, the, in, in Asia and in, in America broadly, Asia and America, those two, two migrations, they found fauna that just didn't understand what humans were, and they just, well, stood there, and bang, gone. <laughs> That's right. And so, so the, 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 the amount of um, uh, extinctions that we caused in, outside of Africa is phenomenal. Yes. And these are, and these are, the, early, uh, these are the early humans. That's right. Uh, this is pre Maori, pre Aborigine. These, these are pre those Aborigine, or where the Aborigines came from. There's, I, I'm talking not, about maybe. Old. I'm talking it's about not. maybe four thousand years ago. So it's already pretty late in in the game, so to speak. Yeah. It's mostly cultural migration, not actual human migration. Yeah. Yeah. Because yeah. because the Bushmen, uh, the Kalahari, on that that sort of Central Africa stuff. Um, that that had taken hundreds of thousands of years to evolve to a sta stage where they were in harmony. In effect, in, in mm -hmm. there was no there was no such thing as an externality. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's all sort of internalized because if you didn't, you died. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So there's, there's a lot of interesting, I think, a lot of very interesting lessons, and actually probably deeper. There's probably interesting lessons to look at the different. Indigenous community to see how imbalanced they are, you know, mm -hmm. compared to, compared to the um, the Kalahari. Yeah, I think I, I I've seen this word before. It's a it's a pack of icons for the Ubuntu operating system. Uh, they just chose the name Kalahari <laughs> to to honor the Kalahari people. Yeah, 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 um, yeah. Well, I mean, Ubuntu came out of that culture, so I guess it's yeah, Zulu, yeah, Zulu language, yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. And there's Ubuntu um, social movement now as well, which is reusing it. <clears throat> I don't think Ubuntu is, but the word Ubuntu has been, been I've, I've seen it used by social groups and are not even aware of the operating system. <laughs> <laughs> Well, that's they've taken it straight, a good thing, straight, I guess. <laughs> taken it straight from the Zulu and, and appropriated it again without being without realizing <laughs> it's already been used. Hmm. And that, yeah, that's a funny one because I, I actually helped somebody build a website, and I said, "But you do realize Ubuntu has other meanings to a lot of other people, you know?" <laughs> so they said, so, so "You're going to you're going to lose that on the web if you if your search term is Ubuntu because you would just won't be found." <laughs> it, it's like when Salesforce tried to trademark social enterprise without being aware that it has a meaning in the UK. Uh, yeah. and, and, then, and then, of course, they, they graciously gave it back because, well, there's just no way they're going to win on search engines. Yeah. 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 Um, I, I think I, I have to move on to dinner. Um, so yeah, some, sometimes I think we've got to the point where we're, we're, we're now, we're at the water table, water, the water cooler. That's right. Um, so you're okay with us publishing this video, or 
the yeah. transcript, the video is fine. Okay, that's it's great. Fine. Mm. Yeah, it's been good to talk. Good mm -hmm. to talk. And ask any questions you want um, down the line. Because mm. um, I'm still thinking that this, this has a place maybe not so much i mean we could we could do without we could survive without it in the uk you could survive mm -hmm. without but i think i still think it has a place somewhere and i'll explore it and see what 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 comes out of it no i'm sure it does uh i'm just saying well first you are not alone uh doing this <laughs> there's many okay. different groups of people uh doing this and the good thing about open innovation is that it doesn't have to scale right in in open source um the, sure. 99% of projects, they just push on GitHub and then and then disappear. But, but I mean, people just pick up and run with it. And and that's like, it doesn't even need to scale in any of the three dimensions we just talked about. It's just there. Right. So that's copy one comfort. Copy one com that's right. That's one comforting thought. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Good. All right. Enjoy, Take enjoy care then. Summer. Yeah, have, have a good little <laughs> time. If you if you have if you want to meet up and when you're in London just mm -hmm. just give me a shout and I'll sure. hop on a plane. Sure, I'm I'm still uh, finalizing my schedule, but I'll let you know. Okay. Yeah, and it'd be interesting to hear your 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 take on the the Scottish experience. Because mm. so I think you're going up there first and then coming down to London. That's right. That's right. Yeah, interesting comparison. Mm. Very interesting comparison. Okay. Well, cheers yeah. then. Till next cheers. time. Bye. See you. Bye.